This is Lesson 25 in our Calculus 1 series, The Definite Integral. In the last lesson, we saw the left-hand sum and the right-hand sum as ways to approximate area under a curve. The left-hand sum is a summation i going from 1 to n, f of xi minus 1, delta x, and the right-hand sum, summation i going from 1 to n, f of xi, delta x. And in both of these cases, delta x is equal to b minus a over n, and xi is equal to a plus i delta x. And in these approximations, we're using f of xi minus 1, or f of xi, as the height of the rectangle over the ith subinterval. But actually, we can use a function evaluation at any point in the ith subinterval. So we can use any ci in the interval xi minus 1 to xi, that's the ith subinterval, and we can take f of ci as the height of the rectangle over the ith subinterval. Also, we could use different sizes of delta x for different subintervals, and then we'd call that delta xi as the size of the ith subinterval. So, for example, in f of x equals sine of x to the third, for this function it would be useful to have an adaptable subinterval width. Because in the interval, say, from negative 1 to 1, there's not that much function variation. So we might want to use a bigger delta x. But as we go out towards 2, 3, and 4, the function is varying quite rapidly. And so we would want a smaller subinterval there. Now let's take a look at this definition for the definite integral of f from x equals a to x equals b. The symbol is an elongated s, that's our definite integral symbol. We have a lower bound of a, an upper bound of b. We have f of x inside the integral with dx. Now this notation means the limit as the maximum delta xi go to zero of the summation i going from 1 to n of f of ci delta xi. So let's examine what's in this definition here. Here, delta xi is the width of the ith subinterval, which we said could potentially vary, which is why we're calling it delta xi instead of just delta x. That gets multiplied by the height of the rectangle, the function evaluation that we are choosing as the height of the rectangle, so that's f of ci, where ci, again, is some point in that ith subinterval. We're summing up these areas for n rectangles, and then we want to let the number of rectangles go to infinity. But because we have this varying subinterval size, what we really need to say is that the largest subinterval size is going to zero. And so that's what this is saying here. And this is our definition for the definite integral of f of x over the interval ab. Now, you might be thinking, what does this have to do with what we've been doing so far? Well, Notice that if f is integrable, meaning if this limit exists, then this limit would be the same as the limit as n goes to infinity, summation i going from 1 to n, f of xi, delta x. This is the limit we have for the exact area under the curve. And notice I've been saying under the curve, and that really only applies to functions f of x that are greater than or equal to 0 over the interval a, b. So in that case, this integral gives us the exact area under f of x over a, b. But here we're defining this integral for any function defined on the interval a, b. So what does this integral give us for functions that have both positive and negative values? For example, the graph we saw above, f of x equals sine of x to the third, has function values that are both above and below the x-axis. So if we take a look at the integral here from negative 2 to 2, notice that the function evaluations in the Riemann sums where f of ci is positive gives us a positive area of a rectangle. But where f of ci is negative, we're getting that area with a negative sign because that function value is negative. So what happens is with the integral, 
areas above the x-axis are counted with a positive sign and areas below the x-axis are counted with a negative sign. So the integral in this case does not measure the total area as in the amount of carpet we would need to cover the shaded area. That's not what we're getting from this integral. The integral gives like a net area. It counts the areas above the x-axis with a positive sign and it counts the areas below the x-axis with a negative sign. But it's still a very useful computation for us, which is why we have this definition of the definite integral. And we'll see more about this idea towards the end of the lesson, but I just want to go back up and point something out here. I've labeled this sum here as a Riemann sum. That's the name that we give to a sum of this form, where we're taking a function evaluation at a point in the ith interval multiplying by delta xi. Any sum of this form is called a Riemann sum for f of x over that interval. And so when we take a Riemann sum with delta x equaling b minus a over n, then this limit on the right simplifies into the limit of the right-hand sums that we were looking at for area. So when we compute our definite integrals using limits, we don't need to worry about limit as the maximum delta xi go to zero. We could make our computations with delta x equaling b minus a over n, and so we could simplify this notation into this limit. So looking at an example here, we have the definite integral from 0 to 5 of 1 plus 2x to the third dx. So using the simpler form of the definition, we have a limit as n goes to infinity, summation i goes from 1 to n of f of xi delta x. And we saw this type of limit in the last lesson. The first thing we need to do is find delta x. Here we have b equals 5, a equals 0, so delta x is equal to b minus a over n. That's 5 over n. That's going to go in here. It's also going to help us with our computation for xi, because xi is a plus i delta x. a in this case is 0, and delta x is 5 over n, so xi is equal to 0 plus i times 5 over n, or 5i over n. Now we need f of xi, so let's take our xi, 5i over n, and let's plug it into the function f. So that's 1 plus 2 times 5i over n to the third. So that's 1 plus 2 times 125i to the third over n to the third. Or 1 plus 250i to the third over n to the third. This is f of xi, and that goes into our limit here. So now let's set up this limit of the sum computation. That's here. Now we want to distribute and simplify our right-hand side and turn it into separate summations. So multiplying through the 5 over n, we're here. Separating into two separate summations, we're here. And notice we pulled out the constant here of 1250 over n to the fourth. That's so that we could easily use our summation rule for i to the third. And notice with all of this, the limit stays on the outside of the big brackets that hold all of it. So we want to take this limit using limit rules. Remember, this is a constant in terms of the summation because i is what's varying here, and there is no i here. So this is a constant, so its summation is going to be this constant times n, which gives us just 5. And here we have our summation rule for i to the third. And so here's a 5, so the limit as n goes to infinity of 5 is just 5. And here, notice we have a 1250n to the fourth as our leading term in the numerator, and a 4n to the fourth in our denominator. Since those powers are the same, our limit is going to be the ratio of the coefficients. So that's 1250 over 4, and so we have 5 plus 1250 over 4, and that's 635 over 2. And that is the value of our definite integral. Now, it just so happens that for this interval 0 to 5, this function 1 plus 2x to the third is going to be greater than or equal to 0. 
So this also represents, we could say, the area under the curve of this graph over this interval. And we can check our work here using the method that you're going to learn in the next lesson by taking the antiderivative of the function inside the definite integral. So here we have x plus 2x to the fourth over 4. Simplifying, we have a 1 over 2 here. And then we're going to plug in the 5 for x, then plug in the 0 for x, and subtract those values. And that again gives us the same 635 over 2. And so we'll go into this method more in the next lesson, but because the method is easy, I think it's worth mentioning here so you can check your work. Let's take a look at another example. Here we have the integral from 1 to 2 of x to the third. And so computing this as a limit, we take a limit as n goes to infinity of the right-hand sum. First thing we need is delta x. Delta x is b minus a over n, so that's going to be 2 minus 1 over n, so that's 1 over n. Then we need xi. That's always a plus i delta x. So in this case, that's 1 plus i times 1 over n. So 1 plus i over n. We plug that into f f of x equals x to the third, so this is 1 plus i over n quantity to the third, which we're going to have to multiply out. So I've done that work over here. And that's 1 plus 3i over n plus 3i square over n square plus i to the third over n to the third. And so this is f of xi, and so now we need f of xi multiplied by delta x inside our summation with a limit on the outside. And that's here. Limit as n goes to infinity, i goes from 1 to n, f of xi multiplied by delta x. So distributing, we're here. And then separating into individual summations, we're here. Again, we pull out the constant multiples that don't have to do with i. And so we're here. And now we use our summation rules to replace these sums with expressions in n. And once we've done that, we can take the limit. Here we just have a 1. Here we have a 3n squared as a leading term in the numerator and a 2n squared in the denominator. So that's going to give us a limit of 3 halves. That's here. Here we're going to have a 3 times n times n times 2n. So that's going to be a 6n to the third in the numerator. Also a 6n to the third in the denominator. And so that limit is going to be 6 over 6 or 1. And in the last term, we have n squared times n squared as our leading term in the numerator, so that's n to the fourth, over 4n to the fourth. That gives us a limit of 1 fourth. And so summing that up, we have 15 fourths. And checking our work by using the antiderivative, we have x to the fourth over 4. We plug in x equals 2, plug in x equals 1, and subtract and we get the same answer of 15 fourths. Now, we said above that this definite integral can represent areas above and below the x-axis, and so sometimes it's easier to compute a definite integral by interpreting it as an area. So for example, here we have the integral from negative 2 to 0 of 1 half plus radical 4 minus x squared dx. Now if we go to set this up as a limit like we were doing in the last two examples, we would have some trouble because of this radical. We wouldn't have summation rules to help us get around that. So that's not going to work for us. But if we recognize that this function is a semicircle of radius 2 centered at the origin, shifted up by 1 half unit, we could recognize this integral as an area and compute the area. So this is radical 4 minus x squared plus a half. I've shifted that semicircle up by 1 half unit. And so we're talking about the area under the curve from x equals negative 2 to x equals 0. So it's this pink shaded area. Well, we know how to find the area of a circle, so we can take 1 quarter of the area of this circle. 
and then we can take the area of this rectangle below. And so this integral is equal to one quarter of the area of the circle, which is one quarter pi r squared, so that's just pi here, plus the area of the rectangle. That rectangle has a width of two and a height of one half, so that's just one. So this definite integral is equal to pi plus one. But let's take a look at an example where we have f of x that goes above and below the x-axis. Here we're asked for the integral from negative 4 to 6 of f of x dx. So we know that that's going to be all of this area above the x-axis counted with a positive sign, and then from it we subtract this area below the x-axis. So what we need to do here is compute these areas. And so to make it simpler, I've broken down this integral. Let's take a look at the integral from negative 4 to negative 1 first. That's going to be the integral over this interval. So we're talking about the area of this triangle. Well, what's the area of that triangle? It's 1 half times base times height. So it's 1 half times 3 times 3, and so that's here. Now let's take a look at the integral from negative 1 to 1. From negative 1 to 1, we're here. That's going to be the area of this rectangle. And so that's going to be 2 times 3. That's here. The integral from 1 to 2, integral from 1 to 2 is the area of this triangle. 1 half times base times height, so 1 half times 1 times 3. And notice, all of these areas so far have been above the x-axis. So they all get a positive sign here when we evaluate them as areas. But looking at the next integral from 2 to 4, we realize that that area is going to come up with a negative sign because those function evaluations are negative. So it's still the area of the triangle, 1 half times base times height, 1 half times 2 times 2, but it's going to have a negative sign. You could think of this height as being a negative 2, or you could just put the negative sign in front of your computation. So that's going to be a negative 1 half times 2 times 2. And so that's here. Then the integral from 4 to 5 is the area of this rectangle and that's just 1 times 2, again with a negative sign because it's below the x-axis. And our last part, integral from 5 to 6, another triangle below the x-axis. So 1 half base times height, 1 half times 1 times 2, and it gets a negative sign. And so that's here. And so simplifying, we get 7. And so that's the value of this definite integral. And in the next lesson, we're going to learn that shortcut computation for definite integrals that we've been using to check our work. We're going to learn more about that in the next lesson. And this concludes Lesson 25 on the definite integral.